Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of our Facebook Live Talk Sessions. So sorry for the slight delay early on. Now, my name is Andrew. I'm the uh, host for tonight's sessions, and uh, tonight's topic is about all you need to know about colorectal cancer, the risk factors, um, screening tests, and treatments. And it's especially brought to you by 365 Cancer Prevention Society, our new cancer education partner, Pfizer, and our esteemed medical partner, Icon Cancer Center. So please like and share now and comment so that we know you guys are all ready um, to start off uh, tonight's uh, sessions. Now, tonight's session is definitely worth uh, hanging around for because uh, we not only have our usual one speaker, but instead we have two speakers coming on uh, later tonight. So please better chew your kakis uh, and uh, join us um, you know, right now because you won't want to miss out on uh, tonight's uh, wonderful uh, session of uh, sharing uh, with uh, both doctors as our guest speakers. Now, 365 Cancer Prevention Society was founded in 2003 as a social service uh, agency with IPC status and is a full-fledged member of NCSS. Now, the society's mission is to serve the community through holistic cancer prevention measures. This is accomplished through the health and nutrition education, promotion of healthy lifestyle and lymphatic detox exercise programs. We also provide practical and emotional support and care for patients and their family members in their battle against cancer through residential and hospital visitations, counseling and wellness services. Please remember that one is never alone in the fight against cancer. We hope you can join our community in the fight against cancer today. For more information and to stay up to date about 365 CPS, our activities and events, do visit our official website follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Telegram. So don't forget to also like, share, and comment on our social media pages so that more people can benefit from our charitable work. Now, before we proceed with uh, tonight's program, kindly note that all information shared at this session by the speakers and 365 CPS are for general information only and subjected to changes. Do consult your doctor for personalized and detailed medical advice if you have any. We respect your privacy, so please make sure that your questions are not too personal and it is something that we can share with the rest present here tonight. Also, do let others have a chance to ask their questions too. Thank you for your cooperation. Now, to mark Correctal Cancer Awareness Month in March this year, Icon Cancer Center and 365 Cancer Prevention Society decide to jointly organize the My First Colonoscopy campaign together with partners, the Society of Correctal Surgeons and StarMed Specialist Center. This cam campaign seeks to support individuals aged 45 to 70 from low-income families and those who are of higher risk due to family history and symptoms to a fast track sponsored colonoscopy by experienced surgeons from the Society of Correctal Surgeons, complete with a pre and post GP medical consultations at StarMed Specialist Center. Meaning the beneficiaries for this sponsored colonoscopies don't have to wait months for an appointment to see a doctor or to do the colonoscopy. Everything is done at StarMed Specialist Center by qualified and experienced uh, specialists from seeing a doctor to the scope, or in a matter of weeks only. Now, and you guys are the one who can make a difference and making all this possible. So how can you support this awesome campaign, you may ask? Now you can do your part in saving another by donating generously towards this campaign. The details are currently now on screen. All you need to do is to scan the QR code and check out our Facebook pages, the online um, donation portals like giving.sg and Give Asia for more details. And you want to know more about Icon Cancer Center, StarMed Specialist Center, and the Society of Correctal Surgeons, do feel free to check out their websites and Facebook pages. Now, tonight's topic is on correctal cancer. So what is correctal cancer? Now, correctal cancer is a major killer in Singapore, common in both males and females. 
it is the top cancer in males and second most common cancer in females after breast cancer. Today, we learn why screenings is important and the various treatment methods available. Now, tonight's guest speakers are Dr. Patricia Cole and Dr. Chiu Ming Ho. Dr. Cole is a senior consultant and a specialist in medical oncology. With over 20 years of experience, Dr. Cole is an experienced medical oncologist who is practicing at Mount Elizabeth Novena, Glen Eagles, and Mount Avenue Hospital, Singapore. She has subspecialties interests in lung, head and neck, breast, and gastrointestinal cancers. Dr. Chu is a visiting consult senior consultant and specialist in sur surgical oncology. Dr. Chu is the current Singapore Correctal Society's president and has specialist experience in minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery for coronal uh, colorectal cancers, as well as performing complex pelvic surgeries in locally advanced and recurring rectal cancers. So let us welcome and thank both doctors and our guest speakers for tonight, Dr. Ko and Dr. Chu, for joining us um, tonight. Welcome, Dr. Ko, Dr. Chu. Hello, everybody. Hey, Dr. Ko, Good Dr. Chu, welcome. Hi, Good Andrew. Day. Hi, Patricia. Hi, hi. 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 Right. Hi. Thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight and, uh, you know, giving us many, many uh, informative uh, tips uh, in time to come. Now, so um, I will take a, my break, right? Uh, and I think uh, Dr. Chu will join us uh, later, right? Um, so to start us off will be Dr. Ko, who will be starting off with her presentation, right? Thank you, everyone, and I'll see you guys later. Over to you, okay. Dr. Ko. Thank you, Andrew, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'll now share my screen. Um, give me a minute. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. All right. So today's talk, as Andrew has introduced, is all you need to know about colorectal cancer. Um, incidence, risk factors, screening, colonoscopy, and treatment options such as surgery and other medical treatment. So this is a brief outline of the talk tonight. Uh, what is colorectal cancer? The incidence of colorectal cancer in Singapore, uh, the risk factors, screening, uh, treatment options such as surgery, treatment options such as uh, chemotherapy, targeted therapy, immunotherapy. Screening and surgery, uh, colonoscopy will all be covered by Dr. Chiu Min Ho. So what is cancer? Cancer refers uh, to a process whereby old and damaged cells survive instead of dying and new abnormal cells form. In the normal process, old cells will die and new ones will form, but in in such a, and when cancer happens, the abnormal cells will divide without stopping and they'll form a group of abnormal cells called tumors. So a tumor can be benign or it can which is non-cancerous, or it can be malignant, which is cancerous. And a malignant cancerous tumor just re, uh, refers to a collection of cancer cells that have the ability to spread to other parts of the body. Uh, specifically, therefore, then, what is colorectal cancer? So the colon and the rectum equals colorectal, uh, and that refers to our entire large bowel or inter large intestine. And the function of this is to turn what we cannot absorb into our body into waste matter or stools. So colorectal cancer occurs when the normal cells in the lining of the colon or the rectum changes. It grows without out of control and it no longer dies and form a tumor. Usually it'll begin as a non-cancerous or what we call a benign polyp, which over time will become a cancerous tumor. So this is what happens uh, in, in pictorial terms. As you can see, this is a normal colon cancer wall and these are normal colon cancer cells. Over time with uh, inflammation, other external insults or internal mutation, genetic changes within the cells, it becomes what we call hyperproliferative. So a collection of abnormal cells will grow and it will become a, what we call an adenoma or a benign polyp, a, basically a collection of abnormal growing cells. At this stage, this is non-cancerous. And however, if this is left behind, over the next five to 10 years, with further accumulation of insults and genetic abnormalities, 
it will become a colon cancer or a rectal cancer. Hence, this is a very important slide to remember because this is what screening is about, and which is what Dr. Chu will explain to us about. So colorectal cancer, how common is it? And who are the people that would generally get it? Uh, it is uh, the third most common cancer worldwide, the fourth most common cause of death from cancer, and unfortunately, its incidence is increasing globally. The incidence of bowel cancer in developed countries is about three times that in the least less developed countries, uh, being the highest in Australia and lowest in Africa. And over the next 15 years, it is expected that the number of cancer, uh, cases of colorectal cancer globally expected to increase by 60%, uh, up to 2.2 million cases. This is what we see in Singapore, the 10 most frequent uh, cancers and cancer deaths in Singapore. As you can see, and as what Andrew has mentioned, colorectal cancer ranked first in incidence and second in cause of cancer death. So colorectal cancer causes the second most, is the second most common cause of cancer death in Singapore. Among the females in Singapore, uh, colorectal cancer follows uh, is, is second. Uh, followed by third most common cause of cancer death among females. So you may ask yourself, what is the risk of me developing colorectal cancer? The chance of diagnosis of colorectal cancer in one's lifetime is approximately 3.9% um, in males and 2.9% in females. Colon cancer, uh, there is equal sex distribution, whereas rectal cancer may be slightly more common in males. Most are diagnosed between ages 55 to 65 years of age, and about 18% are diagnosed less than 55 years of age. So many of you would say that, hey, but I know a lot of young people who are diagnosed with colorectal cancer, but actually, if you, this is from the Singapore Cancer Registry. It is not quite true. Uh, we, what we see here is that this is the portion uh, of uh, 80 plus years old, and as you can see, over the years, the proportion of uh, 80 plus years old uh, patients are increasing. And this is the age group of 30 to 39 years old, and actually it is decreasing, okay? And maybe this is due to awareness uh, screening. Uh, again, the proportion here, 40 to 49 is decreasing, 50 to 59 is also decreasing, and this portion stays about the same. But as you, the older you get, uh, it seems to be increasing. This is among males. Uh, it is almost the same reflected among females. Uh, the older proportion, uh, the age of more than 80 is increasing in proportion. Um, and so we do see a higher percentage of patients. Uh, this is in all cancers, but reflective in colorectal cancers as well. So what are your risk factors for colon cancer? And I'll break it down to factors that we can change and factors that we cannot change. Okay, I'll start off with, with factors we cannot change. So obviously one is aging. We cannot change the fact that we get old every year, uh, much as we wish to, uh, even with plastic surgery, we can't do that. Um, and it is very clear, as you can see with my slides previously, that the risk increases with age. Uh, there are some genetic factors such as uh, uh, a very long name, familiar adenomatous polyposis, very rare, only less than 1% of patients uh, get that, or hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, 3 to 5% risk, whereby the risk of you, if you have one of these co genetic conditions, you do have a very much higher risk, 70 to 90% chance of you getting colorectal cancer. Uh, inflammatory bowel diseases such as Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Now, this is more common in the Western population, not so common amongst uh, us Asians. And the reason for this being that the inflammation caused by these conditions uh, is a constant insult to the colon cells, resulting in them becoming abnormal. And if you have a past history of a colon adenoma, those benign polyps that I showed before, um, then you will have increased risk of colon colorectal cancer. Fortunately, again, these are factors that we cannot change. The last one that I will talk about, which is something that we can't change because of family history of colorectal cancer, we can't choose our relatives much as we would like to. Um, this refers to a history of no hereditary, so no, um, no hereditary genetic mutation. You haven't inherited a gene from your parents or from your grandparents. It just refers to the fact that you have more than one 
More than two family members with colorectal cancer uh, age more than 50, uh, 60 years of age. Okay, So this is just purely the fact that you have relatives or family members with colorectal cancer um, at any point in time. So if you have no family history, your rough uh, approximate absolute risk of colorectal cancer by age 79 is 4%. But you can see if you have one first degree relative with colorectal cancer, the risk increases up to 9%. And if more than one, uh, the risk increases to 16%. And if you have one affected first degree relative diagnosed with colorectal cancer before age 45 years of age, then your risk is also increased from 4 to 15%. And even if your first degree relative just has a colorectal adenoma, remember this is what we call a benign polyp, um, your risk does increase uh, to 8%. So unfortunately, much as we don't like talking to our relatives sometimes, it may be useful during uh, gatherings to find out how they are doing with their health, because this will give us an idea of uh, how we can uh, uh, how much uh, we need to look after ourselves, okay? So as I said, the impact of family history. So interestingly enough, uh, about 20% of uh, colorectal cancer patients have a close relative with colorectal cancer. And rare, uh, very rarely do we actually see uh, colorectal cancers with genetic syndrome, only about 5%. Um, and as I said before, previous history is also re re uh, does it also increase your risk. Now, this is the more interesting part. I think um, factors that we can actively change, uh, so more related to health, lifestyle-related uh, factors. Smoking, as we know, uh, causes many things, and, and uh, no surprise, it causes an increased risk of colorectal cancer. Alcohol as well. Um, recommended uh, for men is actually two alcohol units and one for women daily. Uh, doesn't mean that you can accumulate uh, for a whole week and then drink 14 units uh, on a Sunday. Uh, binge drinking is, again, also an uh, increased risk of, co uh, of cancers. We know, too, that obesity, uh, high BMI in both men and women are certainly associated with not just death from cancer, but also with increased risk of colorectal cancer. A diet that's high in processed meat. Um, in red meat, a bit, uh, the, 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 conclusion, the evidence is not so conclusive, but indefinitely in processed meat. And physical inactivity can uh, definitely increase your risk of uh, colorectal cancer. So, which therefore means that if, on the converse, if you exercise regularly, you're physically active, you can actually reduce your risk by approximately 25%. And what do we mean by being physically active? We are talking about um, uh, moderate uh, exercise of at least 30 to 45 minutes, uh, four to five times a week. Obviously, you may not be able to start so quickly, but uh, any uh, start slow and going up uh, would be a start for anybody. So we have gone through the family history. What I wanted to point out here is this. If you have inflammatory uh, bowel cancer, your increased risk is 2.6 to 2.8. Smoking causes an increased relative risk of 1.2. So again, this slide is to show us that uh, what is uh, convincing evidence that can decrease our risk of colorectal cancer. What I mentioned before, physical activity, uh, very important. Uh, something that we can all try and do. Um, it's hard to get out of bed to do this, but once you get going, you would actually uh, enjoy it very much. Um, what increases risk? Uh, processed meat. By processed meat, we're refer, we referring to uh, ham, uh, sausages, uh, processed foods um, with preservatives, alcohol, body fat, uh, and adult attained height. Uh, this is, again, uh, uh, they're saying that if, you, you know, this is probably a bit, uh, again, this, this is from World Cancer Research Fund. Um, and uh, they, they, they feel that uh, the, if you attain your height later in age, it could potentially increase colorectal. Cancer, but I, I feel that the evidence is, is much to be seen. Uh, we, we hear a lot about supplements. Um, things like vitamin D, I think there's more and more evidence that it may help. Uh, in any case, vitamin D does help with our immunity, so there's no harm taking it. Red meat, I think we should consume with uh, some, uh, some uh, caution. Um, not too much, but not, uh, no need to abstain from it either. So I think I would uh, pass the, 
the, mic, uh, the time over now to Dr. Richard, uh, to, to Dr. Chu, uh, for him to talk about screening um, and colonoscopy and further treatment options that may include uh, surgery. Over to you, uh, Richard, uh, Minho, sorry. Hi, thanks, thanks, Patricia. Yeah, thanks for that uh, introduction. So I'm just going to share screen, and while I'm pulling up the screen, just give me a few seconds. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining uh, us tonight for this uh, simple public forum. And I'd like to thank Andrew and 365 uh, Cancer Prevention Society as well as ICON Cancer Center for this opportunity. So I think Patricia has gone through a lot of facts and details and I'm just going to jump straight into the talk uh, right now. So my name is Minho. I'm a colorectal and general surgeon. Um, I do keyhole invasive, uh, minimally invasive surgery. I've also done quite a bit of research for cancers in the elderly some of the very advanced pelvic cancers, and I also look at hereditary and fami familial colorectal cancer conditions. I was in SGH and then Sengkang General Hospital. Uh, I was the head uh, and department of surgery in Sengkang, and I was also subsequently the division chair, and it was a fantastic experience uh, in a brand new hospital in Singapore itself. I have no financial disclosures. So colorectal cancer remains number one, the number one cancer in Singapore. And this is a, a poster you've seen uh, many places, and really where the arrows point out is that uh, for males, colorectal cancer is number one. For females, it is the number two cancer. But when we combine the combined uh, in incidents together, it is the top cancer of Singapore. Um, however, sad to say that the survival rates for most colorectal cancer still remains at about 60 to 65 percent, which means that many patients are still diagnosed at a very advanced stage three and stage four. In stage four, as many of you know, it is terminal. It is usually not curative, and it means that the cancer has spread and has metastasized already. So there's a lot of evidence that points to what we can do to reduce colorectal cancer. Some of it has been given in the talk before, and I'll reiterate some of the very important points in this uh, talk as well. So many famous people have colorectal cancer. For some of our seniors, you can recognize Ronald Reagan, Queen Elizabeth, some of our Kurt High singers as well. And they're very famous, and they've also brought a lot of... Uh, attention to colorectal cancer. Now, the colon is a U-shaped organ here, okay, you can see, um, and there are various parts of the intestine that can be subdivided into both the left and the right intestine. Now, the majority of colorectal cancers occur in the rectum and the sigmoid, um, and this is the lower part on the left side, and they present differently for those cancers on the right. <coughs> so colorectal cancer, sometimes has been asked, is there a difference between colon cancer versus colorectal cancer, and really it's about the same, and the rectum is the lower part of the rectum down here. So cancers can occur on the right, it can occur in the transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid, and rectum itself. And as I mentioned, the most common site is the rectal area. <clears throat> so there are four stages of colorectal cancer. One and two are considered early and is localized. Three and four are very considered advanced, and four has already spread to areas like the liver and the lungs. So what are some of the risk factors? So age by itself, and once you're more than 50, you're at higher risk. But young cancers can occur as well. And while the incidence may not be truly rising in Singapore, the incidence still occurs at about 13 to 15% of colorectal cancers um, in Singapore. And this is a chart that we have seen in the cancer registry. And um, uh, there's still quite a few cancers that occur between 30 to 49 years old. <coughs> For Asians, um, the Chinese is a higher risk in Singapore. Um, and also if you have a personal family history that Patricia has gone through in elaborate detail. So if a family member with a polyp or a family member with colorectal cancer, your risk is already higher and should therefore go for screening a, a little bit earlier. If you're sedentary, you have high BMI or obese, again, there's a risk factor for colorectal cancer. And of course, smoking and alcohol cause damage, not just the colon, but in many other areas and organs within the body as well. So these are many areas with good food uh, that we consume in Singapore. Chakritiao, Kong Ba, fried chicken, nasi lemak, and these fantastic diets that we have, unfortunately, also are at high risk of developing colorectal cancer. And one of it is my favorite food, fried chicken as well. These are oily, these are processed, these lead to high BMI, high sugars as well. So how do colorectal cancers present? Now, unfortunately, many are asymptomatic. In Chinese, we call it wu sen wu si. They don't have many symptoms until they become very advanced, and they're detected maybe on screening. How else can they present? And you may notice a change in bowel habits. Now, this is what we call the Bristol stool chart. 
most of the time we have a stage three or stage four kind of a type three or type four kind of a stool, which is nice shaped like a banana. But sometimes you may notice that you have increased constipation or be outer bound habits like more watery or loose stools. And you find that these habits, if they're persistent, and we define that as more than three to four weeks, you should probably get a checkup just to ensure that there's nothing serious or a cancer developing within you. So once it becomes very thin, and we're always worried that sometimes there's blockage, the stools become thin, it comes out much reduced in caliber, or if it becomes hard and dry, too liquid or clumpy, then you may want to pay attention a little bit closer. So why does this happen? A very simple animation, the stools reach the cancer, it gets blocked, and because it's compressed and narrowed, it comes out much narrower and hard, hence we call it a reduced stool caliber or pencil thin stools. Uh, stools can also be found, there can be blood in the stools and this is usually very alarming. And why, do, why, do, why does that, is there blood in the stools? So when the stool reaches the cancer, it rubs against it and there's considerable friction and this leads to blood being formed because the cancer is friable and easily bleeds and the blood comes out either mixed with the stool or sometimes comes out after your passing motion. Now, many times the patients say, this is just the tongue, this is just pulse. And when it happens, they dismiss it and they don't pay attention to it. But remember, pulse bleeding can be a manifestation of increased constipation or straining that has resulted. So if bleeding is persistent, especially of its new onset, then you should get a checkup as well. If you notice yourself becoming more lethargic or becoming very pale, and sometimes it's not because we value fair skin uh, in, in Singapore, you should also be careful that your blood count is low. And when it's low, the term is anemia. It may be because of occult bleeding or bleeding that you cannot see with a naked eye. So symptoms like tiredness, easy fatigability, breath breathlessness, or you feel your heart beating very fast. These may be symptoms of what we call anemia or low blood count. You have tummy pain that doesn't go away or keeps coming back and it's crampy and colicky in nature. Be concerned and you may need to check it as well. Or you feel yourself when you examine your tummy, you feel like a small mass or a growth or a lump inside. And these certainly may warrant a tumor inside. It may not be the colon, maybe be other organs as well, but you should come forward and present and, and get a checkup from a doctor itself. So prevention is obviously better than cure. Stop smoking, drink alcohol in moderation. Patricia has mentioned no more than two pints a, a day. And of course, less is better. Um, eat a variety of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. This improves uh, bowel transit reduces straining and constipation. Also, it has to be balanced and don't eat too much vegetables and fruits because that causes a lot of bloatedness and discomfort. And also good exercise that reduces your BMI. It reduces cancer occurrence or recurrence as well. And maintaining a good healthy weight and the BMI for Asians is recommended to be less than 23 to 24. Now, when it comes to screening, okay, there are two options that we have talked about. Uh, one is called the NOFIT or fecal immunochemical test and one is a colonoscopy, and I'll go through both concepts. So many of the patients that come to me ask, what is a screening colonoscopy? What is the difference, and what does it actually mean? Should I actually have a screening colonoscopy? Is it painful? What does a colonoscopy look for? And can things go wrong? Are there complications? It sounds very scary and very, very, um, I'm not convinced I should go for that. So screening, by definition, refers to looking at something where there are no symptoms at all. So for ladies, they're very familiar with pap smears and mammograms, and the colonoscopy is used for colorectal screening. And the aim is to detect any diseases before they become cancers, or to detect cancers at an early, early stage, so the cure levels are much, much higher. And this is one to detect the disease before symptoms may occur. So the FIT, or fecal immunochemical test, is usually given free every year in March, to, and it's been also freely readily available in polyclinics. Now, this is a FIT or stool kit. So basically, what it does is you collect your stool in a certain fashion. Now, we advise you to, for example, face backwards on your toilet bowl. Your toilet, you line it with a newspaper and you pass motion on it. And then you use this green spot and then you put different sides on the stool. And then you put it in a capsule and send it in for testing. Now, what it does is, test is it looks for blood that you can't see or occult blood in the stool. If it crosses a certain number, it will then be considered a positive FIT. And it may suggest that you then need to go for a diagnostic colonoscopy to exclude colorectal cancer. Now, obviously, the limitation of this is not all cancers bleed, and not all cancers may bleed on the day you collect the stool. So you may get a false positive or even a false negative test that reassures you. Therefore, the FIT is not highly accurate at all. But it's cheap. It's non-invasive. You can do it many times. 
But by no means does it mean that it, when it's negative or it's positive, then you need it's confirmatory for colorectal cancer. So when the FRT is positive, a colonoscopy is needed, and the chance of diagnosing advanced polyps or the chance of colorectal cancer is about 20% and 3 to 5% respectively. But you may false positive. This can occur in pulse or diverticular. It, as I mentioned, not all cancers bleed, and not all cancers bleed every day. Okay. Now, a colonoscopy, as shown in this diagram here, basically is a flexible tube that goes from the anus to the right colon. And we perform this procedure with sedation. That means you're asleep. Now, this is very different for general anesthesia. Huh? In general anesthesia, we put a pipe in through your mouth and breathe, and the machine breathes for you. So sedation, you are breathing by yourself, and this medication will give you to be nicely, comfortably asleep. Now, this is done as a day procedure, okay? And the anesthesia is short acting. You're very comfortable, and when you wake up, you can go home already. There's no need to be warded, but it's considered a hospitalization procedure. So we try to detect polyps, and polyps can be small like this. These are about 3 to 5 millimeters, or up to 1 centimeter, or it can be large polyps like this that can be up to 2 centimeters to 3 centimeters in size. And, we, and in this picture, we show we remove the polyps using endoscopic techniques. This is removed with a snare, and after we remove, we might put a clip on it to prevent it from bleeding. And these clips are made of titanium. It will drop off by itself, and this doesn't cause any problems for you in future. So the transformation for a polyp to a cancer will take about 8 to 10 years. And we want to remove the polyps before they've turned into cancer. And this that's why the regular screening with colonoscopy will reduce the risk of colon cancer by almost 90%. So our MOH guidelines will suggest if you have no symptoms at all, you're considered an average risk, you should start doing your scope at 50 years old. However, if you have a family history of colorectal cancer, and this is with any family member, then you should start screening earlier. This is the recommendation of the guidelines to start at 50, or and in between this to do a FIT test annually, and then a repeat colonoscopy in 10 years. However, you are, you're considered an increased risk profile if you have a colorectal cancer in a first degree relative. That is, if you have a brother or sister or a family parent, for example, these are considered first degree relatives. If you have a personal history of polyps, that means you've screened it before, you're also at higher risk. Now, the advice, therefore, is to start your colonoscopy 10 years before the age of diagnosis. What do I mean? In essence, if your family member is diagnosed at 45 years old, for example, you should therefore go for your scope at 35 years old, 10 years before the age of diagnosis. You should start uh, your scopes early at 40 if your first degree relative had a cancer at 60 years old or even younger if necessary. Okay, and the option of a colonoscopy, the frequency will say is faster and higher at about every five to ten years or even earlier. So this is Ipin, this picture, he's my patient. He was diagnosed unfortunately at 18 years old and it was very shocking for him and his family. Now he was a JC student, he had tummy pain and his mum and dad thought because he played computer games at night. But when he came forth, he found a big mass in his tummy and he was diagnosed with colorectal cancer. We are happy to say that he had successful surgery and he's now about nine years, eight years out from his cancer surgery, but his cancer was very advanced in the chemotherapy as well. But he completed his A-levels, he did very well, became an A-star scholar. But the message here is that cancer can occur at all age groups. So you may, while you're asymptomatic, it may be fine to go for a routine health screening. But when you have symptoms, you should come forth to check early because colorectal cancer can occur at all ages. So in fact, the American guidelines have modified and are very different from our local Singapore guidelines. Americans have now suggested you should start scoping at the age of 45 years and older. And I think the aim is really because they're seeing a slightly higher incidence in cancers in the Western population. While it may not manifest here in the Asian and Eastern population, our demographics here are very similar because of the diet we eat and the lifestyle we live as well. Now, when you do a scope and some of the nitty gritty that's required, this is often the most difficult bit for the colonoscopy, the bowel preparation. So what we need to do is drink this uh, the various preps below in the picture and to clear and flush out all the bowel, uh, the poop inside and the stools to ensure that when we do the scope, it's nice and accurate and clean. The first picture on the left is what we want to envision when you do the scope. You can see and look at the lining very well. But the second picture you can see is very, very dirty. We may miss and not see uh, cancers or uh, uh, polyps inside as well. So the guide is to have this light yellow on the right of the picture when you have finished your bowel preparation. And then your colonoscopy will be accurate as well. 
the certain guidelines you will need you to uh, adhere to to have a diet, good diet, low uh, fiber diet prior to the scope. So that's nice and clean. We may need to stop some blood thinners. And we also ask you to stop uh, smoking and alcohol because this will interfere with your sedative drugs as well. If you're on Chinese traditional, traditional Chinese medicine, we also advise you to stop at least 7 to 10 days because it may cause bleeding problems during the procedure, which you want to avoid. And the risks of the procedure are very, very, very low. So this is a MOH screening guidelines. You can see the risk is 0.03%. That's about 3 in 10,000, uh, 1,000 chance to, three in, uh, to about 9 in 1,000 chance for what we call perforation of bleeding. So bleeding, as I mentioned, we may put a clip there to stop it. We sometimes may have to use lasers to burn it if, it, uh, if a poly, uh, if removal leads to bleeding. But the more serious one is called a perforation, where they may puncture a hole in the intestine. And if this happens, you need surgery to repair it. But often this is very, very rare. So is there any other alternative? Okay, so this is called a CT colonography or a barium enema. So the CT uh, on the pictures on the left is like a cartoon. You can see it flies through. You can see the cartoon picture of a polyp, but you still need a colonoscopy to go through and remove the polyp subsequently. The accuracy, as you can imagine, is lower. It's only about 80 to 85% accurate. And there's also a tremendous amount of radiation is required to diagnose this. If a chest X-ray is a unit of one, a CT colonography has about 700 to 750 times the amount of radiation as well. For a barium enema, most of us uh, as colorectal surgeons and gastroenterologists rarely use this modality because the accuracy is even lower at about 60 to 70 percent. So most of us will do a colonoscopy up front if you're fit or a CT colonography if you're very frail or have recent heart attack and stroke as a form of screening tool as well. So finally, I'd like to show you a video. This is a patient who came to me with no symptoms and this was Mr. J. Now he had uh, a buddy who said, hey, you better come and scream because you drink quite a bit of alcohol. And when we did the scope, we found this large polyp you can see on the screen. Now, during the scope, we put what we call a snare in. This polyp is about two and a half centimeters in size. The polyp is then kept snuck, and we then use the electrical current, or called a diatomy, to cut through the stalk. Now, as you can appreciate, when a large polyp is like that, the risks are obviously higher. Okay, and the chance of bleeding is very, very high in this because it can be large blood vessels going through. So the stalk and the stump of the polyp is here. You can see on the bottom of the screen. And we successfully applied the clip on it to stop it from bleeding. Now then, how do you remove this? Okay, but before removing, because we may be concerned there may be a tumor inside the polyp, we then put a marking on the colon. This is called a tattoo. So in case there's cancer and we need to do a proper bowel surgery or colorectal cancer operation, this blue mark allows us to visualize where the colon is because we can't feel or see where this polyp area is already. Okay, and then now we have to remove this polyp. So those who have been to like uh, Hai Di Lao or Beauty in the Pot, this is very similar. You're like fishing a fish pot out. We bring it into the net and then we pull it and we draw it and remove it through the anus and send this whole polyp for assessment by the pathologist to determine whether it's cancerous or not. So all this, the patient is nice and comfortably asleep. This procedure took us about 12 to 14 minutes. It's removed. Fortunately, it's benign, but it was advanced polyp and he didn't need any uh, operation subsequently. With that, that's the end of my talk. I'd like to thank you for your kind attention and time. And also, I'd like to acknowledge the Society of Colorectal Surgeons, 365 Cancer Prevention Society, and Icon Cancer Center for this opportunity. And I'd, I'd now like to hand my time back to Dr. Patricia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chu. It's always great to have surgeons on the talks because they have lovely videos as opposed to us. We only have uh, slides with pictures, not very entertaining. So hopefully you all stay awake for my last 10 minutes of uh, talk, um, whereby I'll try and share some general principles of uh, colorectal cancer treatment and some of the newer uh, treatments that we have uh, for colorectal cancer. Um, hang on. Sorry. Okay, um, so here, so as we all know, chemotherapy, whenever you hear the word cancer, chemotherapy is the buzzword. Um, but, you know, beyond chemotherapy now, we have targeted therapy, immunotherapy, as well as I'll briefly touch on radiotherapy, just one slide, even though I'm not a radiation oncologist. But they are all treatments suitable for uh, colorectal cancer. So as, um, how is colorectal cancer treated? Depending on the stage of the cancer, uh, usually one or more treatments may be used, uh, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy. 
So how do we do the staging? Uh, so if you're diagnosed with colorectal cancer after you've gone through, uh, after one has gone through the screening colonoscopy, um, when you see an oncologist or, or your surgeon, he may order a PET CT. Uh, these are scans to look for the spread of the cancer. So unfortunately, in this patient, uh, the cancer would have uh, had spread to the liver. Uh, most of and, and if it hasn't spread, then uh, we call it locally advanced uh, colorectal cancer. Next would be to do surgical staging. So if you have no spread, uh, what you normally would do would be to go for surgery. And after surgery, the surgical specimen would be looked, uh, 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 looked at under the microscope. We'll look at the lymph nodes, the extent of the tumor to the wall of the colon, and so on. This will be in my next slide. So here it is. Uh, if there's no spread, uh, what would uh, we'll be interested in will be uh, stage zero to three. Uh, usually, this is determined, the stages between one to three is determined as to how far the tumor has penetrated through the, to the wall of the colon. Uh, stage four basically refers to cancer, uh, colorectal cancer cells that have spread out of the colon and the rectum to other parts of the body. So for example, stage three colorectal cancer, not only does it uh, go to the last layer of the, it can go to the last layer of the bowel wall, or it could have spread to the surrounding lymph nodes. So there is a, a combination of factors that uh, allows us to stage uh, for colorectal cancer in the early colorectal cancer state, uh, stages. So what are the survival rates for colorectal cancer? And, and, and this, I guess, relates to what Dr. Chu has been telling us about why screening is important. As you can see, if you have early detection of colorectal cancer and you're picked up at the early stage, such as stage one, your five-year overall survival stage, uh, uh, survival uh, percentage is almost 90%. Is 90%, and for stage two is 80%. But once you reach stage three, whereby either the cancer has grown to the wall or you have lymph nodes, it has gone to the surrounding lymph nodes, then your five-year overall survival does drop drastically to 40 to 75%. And unfortunately, if uh, the cancer has spread to other parts of the body, then survival rates do drop to 5 to 15%. So therefore, the importance of what Dr. Chu has been talking about, screening, early detection, uh, prevention of colorectal cancers. So... What is chemotherapy? Uh, we all know we, whenever people talk about chemotherapy, the first vision would be someone vomiting into a bucket next to the bed. No longer is it like that. I think we all have to change our impression of chemotherapy. Um, but chemotherapy is recommended in certain situations uh, for colorectal cancer. In early colorectal cancer, such as stage 3 colorectal cancer, is recommended post-surgery. And this is what you, uh, the doctor would term as adjuvant chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is usually given as a drip, uh, such as a cannula in the vein. And the role of adjuvant chemotherapy given post-surgery is really to reduce the risk of cancer recurrence. Chemotherapy, however, given in patients whereby the cancer has spread, i.e. the stage four colorectal cancer patients, we call it palliative chemotherapy because the role of this chemotherapy is to control the cancer as much as we can while maintaining a good quality of life for the patient. So where is adjuvant chemotherapy used? It's mainly used uh, for stage three, uh, locally advanced colorectal cancer. Uh, it's a standard treatment uh, in what we call good performance of fit patients, usually a combination of drugs called oxaliplatin is used. Uh, in plural uh, performance stage, uh, status patients, so patients who are not so fit, then we'll use mainly only one drug, uh, so a less aggressive uh, treatment option. So for stage four colorectal cancers, however, um, now we are trying to personalize the treatment for our patients. Um, no longer do we do the one size fit all uh, treatment. Uh, how do we do that? I think one size fit all means giving chemotherapy to, you know, to, to everyone. Um, so how are we trying to do this in colorectal cancer patients? And why is it important? Obviously, it's important because what we all want is to get a drug that has little side effects and very beneficial to us. Uh, we definitely don't want a drug that has uh, a lot of side effects and totally not beneficial. 
So what we are trying to do is to try and identify this group of patients or, uh, and, and not just give the same drug to every, every patient uh, with, with no um, uh, discrimination. So obviously the benefits is that we have prognostic tools to try and identify the patients who actually need the, the treatment or we can also identify patients who will benefit from a particular drug and therefore we do not recommend drugs for patients who may not benefit from it. So very simply, what, uh, so I'll move on now. Therefore, personalized treatment uh, includes targeted therapy and a very simple thing would be a smart bomb versus a cluster bomb. Uh, you want a, a bomb that is targeted uh, and not just one that blows up the entire country. So an example of this is a drug called cetuximab or anti-EGFR antibody. Uh, I'll use this next slide as a, uh, uh, to explain because it will be much uh, easier to do so. And the whole idea is to find the right drug for the right person at the right time. So this is a colorectal cancer cell, for example. Uh, it has something called a non-mutated KRAS. So a genetic abnormality called KRAS. Uh, which is not mutated and what we will call wild-type colorectal cancer. So this KRAS is something that we can identify. Now, once we identify this colorectal cancer cell with the KRAS wild-type, then we should find a drug that can stop this particular cancer cell. And we did. Uh, so in this particular cancer cells, it has this uh, receptor called EGFR. And if these EGFR receptors are activated, the cell, the cancer cell becomes activated and the cancer cell will continue to grow, to spread and to, to, to grow more abnormally. So what do we do? We get a drug that can block this EGFR receptor. And we did find the drug and the drug is called cetuximab. And very simply, it is an anti-EGFR drug. So it blocks the EGFR receptor. And so we have a perfect solution here. We, we are able to identify the, the colorectal cancer cell that can respond to this drug, okay? Um, so in this way, if we do KRAS testing in all the colorectal cancer patients, approximately 40% of patients will be saved from having unnecessary treatment. And therefore patients would avoid having to undergo unnecessary side effects from these unnecessary treatments and it will definitely save time and money uh, for, for the patients. Another type of targeted therapy uh, is a more simplistic way. Um, as you can see here, this is a large tumor with a lot of blood vessels. And all these blood vessels are actually very abnormal. But all these blood vessels serve as conduits or, or as you can think of roads uh, with, with nutrients uh, to, to the tumor. And so the more roads bringing nutrients to the tumor, the quicker it will grow and the bigger it will grow. So this drug called bevacizumab or anti-angiogenic drug is that it switches off um, the blood making, uh, the blood vessel growing mechanism. And so once you have uh, no blood vessel, if the blood vessels are therefore disrupted and unable to grow, then the flow of nutrients to the tumor is disrupted. The tumor has no food, simply uh, the same starvation uh, the tumor will shrink and the tumor could potentially disappear. So this is another form of uh, what we call targeted therapy. The other treatment that uh, many of us might have heard about would be immunotherapy. Um, and I would call it new kid on the block, but unfortunately, as you can see this article, it is in 2014. So no longer very new, but it is one of the latest treatment in cancer treatment. And we are continuing to find uh, new uh, possibilities of using this drug. drug. Uh, and in colorectal cancer, a small percentage of patients can benefit from it. I'll briefly describe what immunotherapy does. It is actually a treatment that simply uses one's immune system to fight cancer. And it can be done in a few ways. Uh, one is to sim stimulate one's own immune system to work harder or to give immune system components uh, to try and block, uh, activate the immune, uh, immune system of the person. So the good thing is that because immunotherapy unleashes your own immune system, therefore it selectively kills cancer cells 
uh, saving the healthy cell. Because what we are always, I always get asked by our patient is, oh, but chemotherapy will kill all my healthy cells and so I'll be very weak and therefore I do not want treatment. Um, in a way, targeted therapy and immunotherapy therefore targets more of the cancer cells and preserves more of the healthy cells. So it, I wouldn't deny that it has, it, I wouldn't say that it has no side effects, uh, it would have fewer side effects uh, in this situation. So very simply, what happens here would be that uh, once normal immune response would be that our immune cells called T cells when functioning would be activated and we can attack the cancer cells uh, on our own. However, uh, when cancers are very smart, they can evade the immune system through what we call a PD-1 pathway. So these receptors, they camouflage itself, all right? Um, what we give then is the immunotherapy, which will activate these immune cells or deactivate the, the camouflage. And by taking away the camouflage, uh, our own immune system can actually recognize these tumor cells and start to attack these uh, tumor cells. So therefore, uh, the role of immunotherapy in colorectal cancer, uh, as I said, is, is very important in a small group of colorectal cancer patients. And if in this particular group is called microsatellite in, in, instability high groups, and if, you can, if these patients are identified, they respond remarkably well to immunotherapy. Uh, some of these patients, uh, although they have uh, this uh, stage 4 colorectal cancer, they can survive for many years because you're actually using your own immune system to fight the cancer. So as I said, I'll briefly touch on radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is sometimes used in locally advanced rectal cancers and in some stage 4 colorectal cancers for local symptom control such as pain. And there are advances in radiotherapy too. Um, they are now more uh, targeted uh, using image uh, targeted uh, tomotherapy uh, so that they reduce the side effects uh, to the surrounding organs. The other advance that we have is uh, molecular profiling. Uh, I'll touch very quickly on this. Uh, this allows molecular profiling or next generation sequencing allows us to identify abnormal molecular mutations in the, uh, colorectal cancers in patients that may have gone through the standard treatment already. And we are trying to expand treatment options by matching the patient with potentially other targeted therapies, as well as potential clinical trials uh, that are running in, in either uh, Icon Cancer Center or in national cancer centers. So for example, uh, this is a, a, a report of a mutation uh, called EGFR, and it will give you the approved uh, therapies, uh, and some of the sometimes they will give you what potential clinical trials that, that, that are available, and patients can be appropriately referred to these trials. So, in to to end off, I'll just end off with uh, one one note about stage four colorectal cancers. As I said, uh, usually when cancer has spread, it's very hard to cure. However, in certain cases whereby the cancer has spread to only one organ, for example, a colorectal cancer that has spread to the lung and there's only one spot in the lung or only one spot in the liver, then they can potentially go for surgery. And by resecting that particular one spot, uh, we, we have seen very good uh, improved outcomes. And, so, and some of these patients could be potentially cured. This is a slide uh, just to show that uh, we are actually improving uh, with advances in treatment and maybe some of the colorectal cancer screening programs that have uh, that are present in all these global countries. The, the red line uh, refers to colorectal cancer mortality. As you can see in the US, in the UK, amongst the males, even in Singapore, in the Scandinavian uh, countries, the mortality is decreasing. Unfortunately, in Philippines, in both males and females, the cancer appears to still be increasing. Uh, and maybe that is because some of the advanced treatments are not available or that the screening programs are not as robust as it is in, in some of the developed countries. This is again in Australia. You can see that although the incidence uh, did increase, it is slowly reducing. Uh, maybe again due to national screening programs being introduced and cancer, uh, colorectal cancer mortality is uh, definitely uh, reducing for both males and females. 
So I'll conclude now uh, by saying that cancer prevention and early detection is the goal of regular corrector screening, be it uh, by colonoscopy, as we hear from Dr. Chiu, um, it being, uh, being able to actually prevent cancers, whereas the FIT test you have to do annually and may not actually be able to prevent cancers. Uh, adjuvant treatment, chemotherapy, uh, referring to chemotherapy given after surgery, uh, does improve uh, survival in uh, stage 3 colorectal cancers uh, by looking at some of the molecular markers such as KRAS and so on and having targeted therapies. These have improved our care for our patient uh, because we are able to identify which patient is suitable for particular chemotherapy. And so uh, we are able now to uh, improve our patient, maximize our treatment benefit and minimize uh, the in impact or, or uh, minimize a poor quality of care on our patients. So with that, I thank you and I'll pass, uh, pass the time now back to um, Andrew for our Q&A. Thank you very much, Dr. Cole. And uh, once again, also thank you to Dr. Chu right, for your very uh, comprehensive and uh, informative content. I must certainly agree with Dr. Cole that you know, Dr. Chu, your your video really brings back, uh, you know, memories, uh, you know, uh, because I did my colonoscopy like about five, six years ago. I didn't really had a chance to know what is going on in there. All, all I did was to really take a nap and then the next thing I know is all done, right? So thank you very much uh, for, for sharing those uh, insights for, for us uh, to both uh, Dr. Ko and Dr. Chu. Now, I hope uh, everyone has also picked up some uh, useful tips earlier on, uh, just like I do, right? And uh, remember, folks, I can't stress this enough. I think you probably hear me say it many, many times, right? Early detections do save lives, and really, it does increase your everybody's uh, chances of survival. So having cancer or, or, or being receiving the news that you have cancer is not the end of the world. Right, but we just have to put on our, our really our fighting gear and you know put up a, a, a good fight. And really, you know, if you don't want to, to go into the extent, then have early screening. And there are many, many screening options available as shared by Do uh, Dr. Ko and uh, Dr. Chu. So, really, you know, um, take charge of it. And uh, I hope you know, um, some of the, the food tips and uh, some of the dietary concerns that is shared by both doctors, I hope everyone would not uh, be really, really raring to go in two weeks' time where all the KTVs, uh, the uh, you know pubs start opening up the doors and everybody start drinking two years' worth of alcohol, right? Please refrain from that. And in terms of ethnicity, yes, as Chinese, we are all always uh, very eager and looking forward towards Chinese New Year and stuff ourselves with all the bar kwa, you know, even though it's, it, it costs us a bomb uh, per kg, right? But yeah, show some restraint and eat with moderation. And yes, also for, for barbecue lovers, yes, the barbecue pits are already open up for booking. You can start to have your barbecue once again but again in moderations and and do exercise right um 365 cps has uh many many groups out in the neighborhood um sharing with everyone in the community in terms of detox lymphatics uh exercise so it's free right so i do encourage everyone to to seek us out and seek out the instructors and uh, join the session so that you can actually start lowering your bmi if you are really a bit on the obese side right and uh, start to get healthy now so without further ado i know everyone is waiting for the very anticipated uh, segment which is the q a time so yeah let's take some uh, questions uh, from from the floor and uh, let's see what do we have here um wow this is a question for dr chu right it's from meng hui um he says uh, i did my colonoscopy last year when uh, he was uh, 51, right? And uh, everything was good. But he also watched out uh, and monitor his stools every day. And, uh, you know, he was asking how can um, he or she, sorry if I get your, 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 your so-called sex wrong, right? Um, how can you tell, right, through the naked eyes um, whether there's blood stains on the stools and not just the, the color of the stools? 
right? I think this is also something very common. Uh. All of us goes to the toilet, right? We really drop our bomb, right? We do our bombing and then, you know, we find that it's very disgusting and then we get out of the toilet without even, you know, take a second look at where we drop our bomb or, or what's the color of stew. So, yeah, over to you, Dr. Chiu. So, I, I know you probably will say, yeah, please look at your stools and then, you know, if you are in doubt, probably take a photo of it and then show it to the doctors, lah, huh? right? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Andrew. So thanks, Meng Hui, for that question. Yes, and I, and I get many photos uh, from <laughs> my patients have <laughs> a lot of very uh, graphic photos. Um, I, I think first and foremost, maybe I talk a little bit about colonoscopy in the fact that uh, your quality of colonoscopy is important. And firstly, it has to do with how clean the scope was. And when you read the report, I mean, sometimes give a slight scoring system, but the endoscopist will tell you, is it very dirty or very clean? Secondly, I think also um, your risk factors are uh, to determine whether how frequent and how soon you should do the next scope. And the third thing, of course, is the experience of the endoscopist, uh, who, who did it for you. And of course, if this is your first time, you, you may also want to be sure that the, you know, the quality of the scope is done well. Uh. So if it is done already, then really it's like servicing a car. Uh. There's, it doesn't mean that you have a warranty period that your colon is okay. But usually, uh, your, your colon is probably safe from colon cancer for at least, uh, in, in my own opinion, three to five years. Okay? So if you do see blood in your stools very soon after the colonoscopy, it doesn't mean you have colorectal cancer and you should rush for a scope immediately. And it may be just your, your pulse acting up, for example. But I think sometimes you, you just have to keep a close eye on this uh, and just ask your endoscopist, with that pulse, how big your pulse, and so on and so forth. Right, so I think really to your question, how do you tell whether this is blood or not? Uh, I have a common uh, complaint from patients that when they eat the red beetroot, uh, they worry it is blood. But then they continue eating and say, hey, my, my toilet bowl all red. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's blood or beetroot. I say, mm, whether you stop eating beetroot for a few days or you know, the red dragon mm. fruit. And then you observe. Uh. But I think the truth is we never really know. And in clinic, what we do is we do a check using our finger to look at the stools and then I think we will tell very um, quite quickly whether there is frank blood or not. So sometimes it may require that. Thanks. Mm. And if I may add, sometimes you so-called there's a common TCM belief, uh, right? When you have uh, blood in your stools, it also meant that you are very heaty, uh, right? So take something cooling, you know, then it probably goes away in a day or two, right? So that's also something uh, very commonly uh, that we, we hear. Right. So um, we have another question from uh, Miss Val. Uh, right. Asking, is it very worrying if a person starts to have uh, IBS symptoms? Uh, maybe Dr. Cole? I think uh, that is quite a general question. I think irritable bowel, I think if you do have irritable bowel symptoms, then you probably should mm -hmm. seek uh, doctor advice uh, to determine whether it's truly IBS uh, or it's something more serious uh, because it's, it's very hard to determine one or the other until you go through the entire history. Uh, you may need to examine the patient and so on and so forth. So I, wouldn't, I would say that it is best if you're not well and you have uh, frequent uh, uh, symptoms of cramping, diarrhea, alternating with constipation, then yes, you should see a doctor to determine yeah. this. Yeah. I was told before that IBS, in order to di properly diagnose IBS, is actually a something very ma fun thing because it's similar like food allergies. You just have to keep on tracing and keep on trying until you know you you, you know what what triggers it and all right. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So Andrew, maybe okay, I you have another. Know that. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. yeah, Dr. yeah, yeah. So so IBS, I think, is usually a, di <clears throat> a diagnosis of exclusion. That's that means you must have yeah look through everything else before we call it IBS. But IBS, as, as Andrew has uh, rightly mentioned, it is very marathon in the sense that it's very non-specific. On one hand, it can be diarrhea. On the other hand, it can be constipation. My only yeah. suggestion is this. I think sometimes you have to identify what is the trigger for this so-called IBS symptoms. And it may be stress-related, it may be inadequate mm. sleep, and so on and so forth. But for us, if you have symptoms that persist and acutely, yeah, within three to four weeks, that is very new, don't dismiss it as IBS and I think probably get a check from your family doctor or specialist. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I think nowadays, you know, as we go through our daily, you know, routines and also because uh, things are opening up, right? 
Um, a lot of things seems to be very much uh, stress related. It could be a typical tummy ache, it could be a headache or migraine per se. So yeah, I mean, we, we just have to take a breather, right? Slow down things yeah, and, and, and monitor the situations yeah, before we jump to conclusions. Right, so um, next we have a question from Mei Wu. Is barium meal still common now? Wow, this is something that I've never heard before. Uh, right, she says she remember having one done at Tan Tok Sing, right, up to years ago. Uh, now with colonoscopy, is it much more comfortable? I will need to go for one in one, two years' time. Either doctors? Mm. Dr. Chu, I'll take yeah. the next question, Dr. Chu. Okay, yeah, so I think barium meal um, was done last time for a stomach evaluation, right? So now we very commonly do a OGD or a gastroscopy for short. So the barium meal, I think because gastroscopy was not so easily available last time, it was done. But like I mentioned, barium, unfortunately, when we drink it, it's not as accurate. And uh, the accuracy is maybe down to 50, 60%. So if upfront, if you have no problems, the, the standard would be an endoscopy, either a gastroscopy or colonoscopy. And, and you're right to say that it's a lot more comfortable now. That the, When I first started training, the scopes were very rigid and very tough. And sometimes they're even shorter. And some of my patients will come from overseas, the doctors will tell them, go to Singapore for a scope because the scopes are newer there and it's longer. And there's some truth in that because like our government hospitals, we renew and we change all our scopes almost every four to five years. And the more flexible they are, unfortunately, the, the need for maintenance is higher. Um, but I, I think generally, don't fear the scopes. Huh? I think I think I will fear cancer more than the test yeah. itself. Thank you. Right. And and I think I, I must attest to it, the doctors are also relatively gentle when they are doing colonoscopy. So don't worry about the scope. Don't worry about you know the doctors being rough on you, right? So you need to go, you need to go and get the screening done. Okay, so um, next question, I, I suppose it's for Dr. Cole, right? Yes. It's from okay. Alicia, right? She's 44. Um, she says that she's uh, diagnosed with uh, colon cancer, stage three, last year in September. She did her checkup annually, um, stool test, cancer marker, etc., etc., And all was good until last year. It's a uh, cancer marker and accurate test for cancer. Cancer marker is definitely mm. not an accurate test for cancer. And I think this is one of the biggest problems in Singapore, whereby we do cancer markers as part of screening packages. And it's very ro wrong to think of it in that manner because uh, cancer markers are for sure not screening mechanisms. So it gives people a false sense of security. So when you do the cancer markers and they're normal, it does not mean that you have no cancer. It is only when the cancer marker is abnormal that it triggers us to think that there may be something wrong. So therefore, uh, cancer marker is for sure not uh, a good screening tool and is, for is also not an accurate test for cancer. But in a situation like Alicia, uh, Alicia, whereby she has a background history of colorectal cancer, if her cancer marker, if the cancer marker has indeed increased, then I'll be concerned that there may be something going on. So uh, tests should be done, such as uh, scans, uh, whether it's CT scans or PET scans, to look for recurrence. So Alicia is slightly different, in her, her case is slightly different um, uh, because for, for her, it is a, she has a background history of cancer, um, but it shouldn't be used uh, widely as a screening test, or if it's used as a screening test, the patient should understand that normal uh, tumor markers does not mean no cancers. Right, thank you, Dr. Cole. Right. Um, next, we have a question from Ling Hop Soon. Right. Uh, if someone did his colonoscopy and detected polyps, what is the MOH stand and practice where polyps are detected? Dr. Chu? Maybe, Andrew, I take the last, mm. the other question by uh, Li Yu Ming also. Can polyps go okay. away by itself? Mm. So okay. I, I will lump it together. Yeah. Sure. So, so I think, uh, Hop Soon and Yu Ming, thanks. Your questions are very important. I think first and foremost, there are polyps, um, there are different sizes and they can be small, they can be large. And large, we define an advanced polyp to be anything more than one to two centimeters in size. Now, the larger the polyp, um, the chance of harboring cancer cells are higher. The second thing is also the shape of the polyp. It can look like a mushroom with a stalk 
okay, look very flat, like a like a pie. Now, when those with the stock, those are easier to remove. We tend to get clearer margins. Those that are flat tend to be more difficult. And sometimes we have heard of this lateral spreading ones. They look almost like normal codon uh, lining or mucosa itself. So I, I won't say this is an MOH stamp per se, but in the international community, I think for polyps that are advanced, we request that our, the patient to go for more frequent colonoscopies. In other words, in my practice, if you're diagnosed with a large polyp of one to two centimeter, and if the margins I feel may not be clear, we may in fact ask to do the scope very much earlier on to remove any remnant polyp, so to speak, if there is any, okay? And this may be within a year. If the polyps are small, we will recommend that you go through a normal surveillance of every three to five years, and this should be sufficient itself. The chance of recurrence or new polyps forming is always there, simply because often the prep of the, the scope it may not be 100% clean. So if you leave the polyps there, it doesn't go away by itself. We find that it does not. But these are the kinds, what we call adenomatous polyps. These are the ones that can transform to cancer. There are other kinds of polyp called hyperplastic, and these have no malignant risk. This we sometimes leave alone and we monitor, but we may need to biopsy off and on just to make sure it has no cancerous risk or transformation. I hope that answers your questions. Thanks. Yeah. Dr. Xiu, from a layman perspective, in, in terms of describing uh, polyps, is it right to use um, reference like uh, polyps are similar like skin tags? Right, that they kind of attach it to to your colon in, in, instead of the skin. Uh, okay, in Chinese we call it seed roll lah, huh? xiao xiao, mm, small mm. small lumps. But but these mm. are actually not skin tags. Huh? In fact, we label it as tumors. Huh? But tumors mm. doesn't mean it's cancer; it's benign. Mm. Um, so tumors is abnormal growth, and sometimes it can be haphazard. Sometimes it can be normal growth. But with our bare eyes as a clinician, we cannot tell for certain whether it's cancerous or not. I've removed polyps that are very small at 5 to 6 millimeters, and it turned out to be advanced stage 3 cancers. And because sometimes it's like an iceberg, we only see the tip of it, we remove the tip, but actually underneath is a large tumor itself. So very hesitant to say small, okay, leave alone, big means mm. a higher risk, and it's quite variable, so to speak. But I won't label it as a skin tag. Thanks. Sure. Okay, uh, we have a question from Eric. Uh, he's a Malaysian. Um, Stage 4 correctal cancer since 2018, uh, went through many circles of uh, chemo, now on target therapy, um, CA mark, markers uh, ups and down, and, you know, asking whether he should uh, seek immunotherapy, right? Is there a good alternative to explore? So immunotherapy, as uh, I highlighted in my talk, is uh, very, for a very select group of colorectal cancer patients, uh, only about 4 to 5% of patients will qualify uh, or rather will respond to immunotherapy. Uh, he should check, he could check with his doctor whether this uh, particular test was done on the his uh, surgical specimen or his biopsy called microsatellite instability. Uh, if that is uh, positive, uh, then he is eligible for immunotherapy. Yeah. Okay. I hope that answers uh, your question, uh, Eric. And, uh, you know, is there any more questions from, from anyone before we kind of uh, end this uh, Q&A session? Actually, anyone? maybe I just uh, jump mm. in and ask Patricia. Sure. So Eric has shared that he has stage four since 2018, and that's almost four years already, and, mm. and really that's very, very good. But what is your view on stage four cancers? And maybe we can just share, you know, how we have advanced treatment so well now in the last few years. Yeah, so I think we are certainly seeing a lot of our patients uh, beyond uh, four, three, four, you know, in the past, we are, we are talking about two years, um, but now beyond that is very common. And I think when I was uh, doing my slides, I, you know, my old slides would have said uh, stage four, uh, colorectal cancer, five year overall survival or five years, uh, but uh, now the latest data are all going up to 15 years. Uh, all this is significant because uh, it does reflect our treatments, not just targeted therapy, but as I said, surgical uh, resection of uh, solitary metastases. Uh, I see a lot of that. Uh, patient recurring uh, stage three, uh, two years, three years after that with solitary lung cancer uh, tumors or liver metastases. And all this resection, they do uh, improve outcomes. Um, so I think a uh, combination of uh, 
improvement in treatments as well as surgical uh, resections for solitary metastases has improved outcome overall. Yeah. yeah. yeah thanks, Pat. And, and I think for our own experience, we have been quite aggressive with many of these cancers. And in my own practice, I've seen stage four living up to eight to 10 years as well. So I think just a, a, a word to Eric, I think don't give up hope. I think keep persisting and, and all the best for your treatment. Mm. Take care. Okay, uh, we have a follow-up question from Hock Soon. Uh, I think it's to, to Dr. Chu. Uh, I think his question is asking, you know, what kind of sizes of polyps would you normally choose to remove? What uh, size would you choose to kind of leave it there and monitor and, and you know, through regular uh, so-called scopes and, and all? Uh, so, Hock Soon, I think at first go, we will try to remove all as we can. But um, there are risks, uh, and the, the two main risks is bleeding and perforation. So I have scoped patients where there are sometimes more than 30 over polyps. And this is the first time, no symptoms at all. And all of them look like adenomatous. Now, I give a rough guide that I don't remove more than 15 or 16 at one shot because the more we cut and burn, the risk of polyps uh, causing complications is quite high. And I tell very frankly to both the patient and relatives, we may need to do a second time to let everything heal before going in again, because we don't want to cause a complication. And so even if you wait three to six months, the polyp won't transform to huge uh, cancers. And we try to remove the big ones first, just to be careful. But then after that comes the question, why are there so many polyps? And sometimes we then have to send for genetic testing to make sure they don't have these genetic conditions that predispose them and their relatives to polyps itself. So the short answer to this is, yes, we'll try to remove all of it, but it may require stage time, uh, stage uh, sessions if there are a lot, a lot of polyps, for example. Next. Mm. Yeah, we've got one, one, one question uh, out of curiosity is, um, for someone who is diagnosed with uh, intestinal metaplasia, I hope I get the term right, or I am in short, um, does it mean that it has an increased risk for correctal cancer or any form of gastric cancer too? Uh, Pat, do you want me to take the question? Yeah, you take the question. You probably okay. see it more um, than I do. Because <laughs> yeah. they don't come to well, me. So, so yeah. simplistic, simple enough, if they don't come to me, it doesn't make... <laughs> you have a hint of the answer. Correct. When you see Patricia, is usually not so good. <laughs> yeah. right? so, I always so say don't come and see me. <laughs> Go and have your scopes. <laughs> yeah, so um, I am or intestinal metaplasia is usually seen at the stomach scopes. Um, now, in Japan, there's, there's a scope surveillance screening program very frequently. They send buses to the prefectures. The patients in Japan go for scopes every one to two years. And this screening mechanism is needed because the chance of gastric cancer is very, very high in Japan. But we haven't seen that risk in the rest of South Asia or Singapore, for example. Nonetheless, many of our patients, because of the you know eating processed foods or uncooked food or just the way the water is, is kept, we are also at higher risk of this bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. And this is again a risk factor for stomach cancer. Now with recurrent gastric transformation of the intestine, the stomach lining, it becomes this thing called intestinal metaplasia. And this is a slightly higher risk for um, stomach cancers in future. So what we normally do is if we find IM for short, we then do a more detailed mapping so that we can look at the stomach to determine how frequent we should do the scopes itself. Now, if the IM is found at the esophagus, at the lining that is very close between the gullet and the stomach, we're concerned that this is a condition known as Barrett's esophagitis. And again, the transformation for that into adenocarcinoma or cancer at this area is also much higher. So in the West, in the US, there's an increased incidence of esophageal cancers from these Barrett's. They in fact do scopes for IM or Barrett's almost six monthly just to make sure it doesn't transform and you may even need surgery or lasers to remove this area. But for the stomach, after the first or two scopes, if they're okay, you may then do a three to five yearly surveillance if the symptoms are mild and patient is able to correct its risk factors. Thanks. I hope that answers your question, Andrew. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Chu. Um, I think thank you very, one, uh, very much for your participation and of course to both our guest speakers for tonight, um, Dr. Ko and Dr. Chu. For your sharing and also answering all the valuable questions from everyone um, here tonight so i think it's now time for our speakers to take their break right and uh you know and also take their leave 
So once again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ko and Dr. Chu, for being with us um, tonight and sharing with us all the valuable information right, about colorectal cancer and the various uh, screening and uh, tests right, that is available. Right, thank you very much, doctors. Right, so, um, okay. So we hope everyone, you know, just like me, have gained much uh, knowledge about colorectal cancer and how to uh, really keep it at bay. Right, so for some of you who have more questions to ask um, doctors like Dr. Chu or Dr. Cole from Icon Cancer Center, or we should know more, then you must really, really, you know, consider doing a yum chow with our doctors. Right, so do sign up for our closed group online workshops by scanning the uh, QR code currently on screen now. Right, we have very limited uh, slots uh, for this uh, session, so do sign up early. And if you would like to know more, um, you can also uh, drop us an email. Now, at this point in time, we would like uh, appreciate if you could um, give us your honest feedback about tonight's uh, session and also what other topics that you would like us to feature in uh, the future, right? So kindly also scan the QR code on screen, right, right now um, to do so and uh, leave us your comments, all right, um, if you have any. Now, our next uh, Facebook Live uh, talk session will be on lung cancer and it's in Malay. So do share and join us uh, together with our speaker, Dr. Wu Wei Xiong from uh, International Cancer Specialist. Um, the talk will be held on the 9th of April, this uh, Saturday evening at 8 p.m. Once again, over our 365 CPS Facebook page, right? So more information is currently um, on screen right now, right? So do join us then. Now, lastly, for more information and to stay up to date about 365 CPS and Icon Cancer Center, our activities and events, do visit both of our official websites. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Telegram. And don't forget to like, share, and comment on our social media pages so that more people can benefit from our charitable work and services. Now, once again, thank you very much for joining us tonight and also to our sponsors for this session, Icon Cancer Center and Pfizer, our education awareness sponsor. So I hope to see you all in the next session and do take care, stay safe and good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.